You may actually find yourself in the season right now unsure of God's will and questioning him. But I want to encourage you today. God's will can be made known to you, but we must play a part. To truly know God's will, we must first delight ourselves in him, meditate on his words, and seek his heart. The story of Sabbath is really not just as simple as God taking the seventh day off of creation. It would be nice if it was that simple. But the first time we actually see the word Sabbath in the Old Testament is not until Exodus 16. At this point, the Israelites have been freed from slavery in Egypt, where they were in bondage for hundreds of years. And they were wandering out in the wilderness. They were very hungry and grumbling about it. Let's be honest, they were hangry. So, anybody ever get hangry? So hungry that you're angry? Yes. Okay. Every day. So God provides them with quail and manna supernaturally. He tells them not to keep any to the next day, but of course, in good Israelite fashion, they don't listen. They hoard it, and the next day they wake up and it's spoiled. Then God told them the day before the Sabbath to collect and save enough for the next day. They did, and it was still good. God provided for them to be able to have a day of rest. Again, keep in mind the lens that the, the Israelites were recently freed from Egyptian slavery, where they likely never received a day off of work for hundreds of years. This was a training ground for them. Could they trust the God who freed them? They had just become free from hundreds of years of bondage, following the rules the Egyptians gave them following the rules of the world in which they lived. Could they trust God with him providing for their needs while being in his rest? Yet some of them still went out on the Sabbath to collect food because they didn't trust God and found that there was no food to be had. This cycle of choosing their trust over our own efforts, over trust trusting God was repeated regularly throughout the Old Testament and is eventually what led to their exile. Earlier this year, Rich actually spoke on the Sabbath in our Sacred Rhythm series. And he said this, I encourage you to go back and listen to that message, by the way, if Sabbath is the idea of Sabbath and rest and taking a day off is something that you struggle with. But he said this, even the Christian life, apart from submission and obedience to Jesus, will be filled with dissatisfaction and inward turmoil. This makes us no different than the struggling Israelites if we choose to ignore the practice of God's rest. In Matthew, Jesus revealed to the Pharisees and to us that rest is not an arbitrary rule to be followed one day of the week. Rather, it's a state of our souls to trust God so that we can live in Sabbath rest. He then went on to show compassion to heal a man on the Sabbath in front of the Pharisees. Rest is not about law or rules or the way we do things or about just taking a day off. Rest is about living in mercy. So what is holding you back today from practicing God's rest? Sabbath is not just about a day of the week, although it is important to take a day off in the week. Rather, it's about a constant state of being in God's presence and mercy. Now let's dive into practicing God's word. So I have a confession that I'm going to share with you all today. If you subscribe to Bob's and my blog, Head and Heart Space, you may be familiar with it, but I will share it for the rest of all of you today. Um, when I was a teenager, I was a part of a children's ministry drama team. And a part of the requirement to be on the team was that we were required to do daily devotions. Makes sense. So we were given sheets to write out the date of the, what we read, what we had read then for the day, and maybe a brief line or two about what we learned. So what's my confession? 
I lied on most of the documents. I often would fill these out half-heartedly and fudge details, and it wasn't necessarily that I didn't want to understand it or I didn't want to read it. Rather, it was often out of my personal embarrassment and shame that I couldn't seem to understand it or appreciate God's word in the same way as others on my team. Do not hold shame or embarrassment for feeling unequipped to understand God's word. Release the guilt you feel for your procrastination when it might more accurately be a lack of knowing where to begin. And the point is, is not so much about where to begin, but that we begin. Renewal of our mind comes through consistent meditation on God's word, intentionally building time to allow him to speak to us. The psalmist affirms this in Psalm 119, verse 5, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Coming up in this week's e-memo uh, from Pastor Rich, you will see uh, several ideas of how to integrate scripture into your regular daily practice. Uh, but today I'm just going to touch on a few that are my personal favorites. So we're all walking around with one of these in our pocket, right? Mini computers. I like to set reminders on my phone. To memorize actually Romans 12, 1 and 2, this passages we've discussed last week and this week, this was my preferred method. method. So I typed in Romans 12, 1 and 2 as the actual reminder into my phone. And then I set it to remind me every day at the same time, and it would pop up every day at the same time on my phone. And then I just took a moment and I would read it. And wouldn't you know it, after a few weeks, that was written on my heart. Participating in a uh, group study. I mentioned last week about our women's group that we've been a part of. And what I love about group study is that it keeps me accountable to do the work of reading God's word so I don't show up empty handed to conversation. Uh, and worship music. Many worship songs are founded in scripture. They're a great way to meditate on his word. I mentioned last week about just, I challenged you, I challenged all of us to just sit for 10 minutes a day in God's presence and allow his spirit to just wash over you by listening to some worship music. If you haven't already done so, go to sherwoodfriends.church slash worship and you can grab this week's playlist. Every week we have it up there for you. So how will you choose to meditate on God's word? There are so many options. I'm sure you probably have ideas of how to meditate on God's word that I couldn't even, haven't even thought of. If so, please come tell me. I'd love to hear your ideas. But it, what is important is not which one or two you pick. It's that you do pick one or two options, ways to meditate on his word. I also want to just throw this out there. If God's word has grown stale to you, then it's not transforming you. And I would really ask you to just ask God and sit in his presence and ask him to refresh your heart and your hunger for his word. Our final application today is to practice God's will. So thinking about our uh, verse, Romans 12, 2. Did you know that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect? Did you know that? Say amen if you know that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Thank you. And did you know that God wants us to both test and approve, that is to discern and act upon his will? We pray for God's will to be known to us. It seems to be this really vague and elusive thing that we can't wrap our minds around. Which path do we go? Which way is the right way? We question why people we love are taken from us or how we could be caught in financial crisis when we've been doing everything right. You may actually find yourself in the season right now unsure of God's will and questioning him. But I want to encourage you today. God's will can be made known to you, but we must play a part. To truly know God's will, we must first delight ourselves in him, meditate on his words, and seek his heart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 reminds us to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You see, it isn't about what college to go to, what job offer to take, or whether or not you should move. 
God's will is to glorify his name and to bring good in all circumstances, and he invites us into that. This is why Jesus came to earth. He not only took the penalty for our sins, but he reminds us that there are only two commandments to living in God's will. In Matthew 22, 37 through 39, he says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. And do so rejoicing, full of prayer, and giving thanks along the way. This is the will of God. So if you are questioning God's will for your life today, accept that he wants to reveal it to you. Choose today to show up and give God glory by both loving God and loving people. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Whatever decision you're facing today, the choice becomes easy and clear when we keep this perspective. 